Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to um, the latest CURA event, Center for Regional Analysis. I am Harvey Miller. I'm a professor of geography, and I'm the director of CURA. And welcome to our first event this semester on the themes of water in cities in Ohio. Are we prepared for climate change? Just things stop working? Okay. Okay, we're back. Okay, so the first of three events this spring semester on waters and cities in Ohio. Are we prepared for climate change? Um, the first uh, next event will be March 30th. Christopher Christopher Impalarenti. I always get the same wrong. <laughs> in Powell and Terry. Excuse me. From the US EPA Office of Research and Development Safe and Sustainable Water Resources Research Program. He will be here on March 30th to talk about green infrastructure research at the EPA's Office of Research and Development. And on April 17th, we're having uh, William Hunt, who's the William Neal Reynolds Distinguished University Professor at North Carolina State University, and he will speak on green infrastructure and ecosystem services, the future of stormwater management. So those are our next two events in the same theme. And uh, for more information, go to cura.osu.edu. And you can find out about that and join our newsletter and our mailing list and you know follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook and all that stuff. And I also want to thank our co-sponsors for these events this semester, the Ohio State Office of Energy and Environment and the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. Let's give them a round of applause. They've been great partners. Okay, we have a distinguished panel here today to talk about waters and city. In Ohio, are we prepared for climate change? And I'm going to introduce them briefly in the order in which they'll be speaking. First is John Stark, and he's the Ohio Freshwater Conservation Director of the Nature Conservancy, and he leads the Ohio Freshwater Conservation Team. He is focused on developing strategies in the Lake Erie and Ohio River basins that will address harmful algae blooms, boost native fisheries, restore stream flow, and reduce impacts from climate change. Speaking second, second, speaking second will be Kristen Appa, Appa, right? Appa, excuse me, Vice President of AECOM. AECOM, got that one right. <laughs> and she is an environmental engineer with over 25 years experience of, um, excuse me, 25 years of leadership experience in water and wastewater utility consulting. And recently, she led a team to develop the Sustaining Scioto Climate Change Adaptive Management Plan with leaders from MORPC, UCGS. USGS, excuse me, City of Columbus, and Delco Water. Speaking third will be Maria Conroy, who's a co-director of um, CURA, and she's a professor in the Milton School. She's an associate professor of city regional planning. Her research interests are focused on planning for sustainable development, especially watershed-based planning, and planning around sensitive and protected lands, including water-related resources. Speaking fourth will be Keith Myers, Vice President of Planning and Real Estate in the Office of Administration of Planning here at Ohio State University. Prior to joining the university, Keith was a founding partner of the urban design and planning firm, and planning and landscape architecture firm of M F MS, excuse me, MKSK. A little stumbling here today, I'm sorry. I should have more coffee. And then finally, Jay Martin, professor in the College of Food, Agriculture, Agricultural and Biological Engineering. And he analyzes and integrates coupled human and natural systems, focusing on the interactions between watersheds and downstream ecosystems and residents. So that's the, our five panelists today. And each one will give a brief introductory presentation, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Thanks, John. <clears throat> So uh, I'm going to just kind of set the stage a little bit and show you a uh, few uh, figures that are out of a uh, climate change pilot that was done for the Ohio River Basin. I worked on this uh, 
for the Ohio River Basin Alliance. The project was funded by the Institute for Water Resources. And basically what this is, is it's a series of slides that show uh, downscale climate projections for the Ohio River Basin. And each of the areas uh, that we looked at are basically uh, what we call hydrologic units. Uh, and so I'll talk about that one that's basically dead center there in yellow, which is uh, the Scioto here. <clears throat> and uh, so I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a heads up as to what it looks like the uh, projected climate uh, predictions will be during a certain time band. So this is the first one. And if you look in the yellow there, uh, the March maximum stream flows, that's what it's really looking at, are actually uh, projected in our case to drop within the next uh, 20, 25 years or so. And then over time, this will change. So if, uh, Okay, kill it. Uh, so this is the next one, and so now everything flips. So as we go out into the future, um, this, by the way, this model has been uh, verified and it uh, used back casted data. That's basically the way that we would look at it, and then we feel pretty confident for the next uh, 50 years or so what it's really telling us. But if you look, all of a sudden that uh, Scioto area that we're in flips and it basically now goes to the high side of what used to be um, the uh, spring flows basically in March. So what that's really telling us is that we're going to go drier in March than we normally do. So March is normally a wetter month. <clears throat> and then we're going to go uh, actually on the high side a little bit. So the important thing to think about is that we're going to kind of flex back and forth and as we're thinking about planting in cities and we're dealing with streams and other bodies of water, we have to kind of consider that they have to flex as well. So this is October. And normally October, historically, in this part of the world has been a very dry month. It's one of our lowest stream flows. And if you look, when we go out into the, um, into the time band that we're actually in, what we're going to see, according to this, is our October is going to get much wetter than they used to be. So average, or uh, the uh, maximum stream flows are actually going to be uh, 35 to 50 percent greater in some cases. So <clears throat> just a, I don't want to leave the impression that the world's going to end or anything like that. It's just important to realize that what we have all kind of lived through and think is normal may not be normal in the future. And so you have to have this flexibility, uh, both within the cities and the streams, to actually be able to handle these kind of changes. So what are the impacts? A uh, couple of different things to think about. All of the water uh, largely that we drink in Columbus is coming from uh, reservoirs. So basically this is O'Shaughnessy uh, on the river just a little ways upstream. And if we have you know, drier conditions, you know, we'll have lower uh, reservoir levels. We have higher ones. We have higher uh, flows. The wastewater issue is that in a lot of cases, these big cities like Columbus, the wastewater permits are conditioned on having a certain amount of uh, water out there to dilute the uh, effluent that comes out. And as a result, we may have uh, some changes that would actually impact that. So if we go lower, uh, the effluent's not being diluted quite as much. And at some points during the uh, year, the flow in the Scioto is actually largely the effluent coming out of the city of Columbus's wastewater. So all of these things are things to sort of think about. A couple other things real quick. Uh, we have had some flooding in Columbus uh, not too long ago, but the thing is we're not thought of as Louisiana, you know, where you've got such a low elevation that we flood extremely easy. But again, the episodes of more torrential rain events are going to be more prevalent. So we have to consider again that we may see more flooding than we've seen in the past. And final slide, just uh, illustrating that you have to think upstream as well as right within the city. So Columbus is there, you see it's the 270 uh, Beltway basically in the gray there. And then just north of us, all of those areas that are highlighted are actually watersheds that there's a lot of agriculture in those areas. Uh, they used to be wetlands. And so what's happening is a lot of cases those wetlands are drained. And as we have more uh, rainfall events, basically you're getting more nutrient uh, lost off the farm fields and potentially makes its way down. 
and Columbus has had a little bit of issues in the last few years with its water supply. So you have to think upstream as well as within the city. That concludes my part to start. It's great that we uh, get to do this all together and, and look at some of the information. I worked on the Sustaining Scioto Adaptive Management Plan. My name is Kristen Anka. And, um, and, yep, that's it. Um, the Nature Conservancy is also on the stakeholder panel for that. And we used a lot of information and data from USGS, which you were probably looking at as well. So it's really interesting to kind of see the different results, well, the same results that we're all getting. There we go. Okay, yeah, there we go. Um, so, Rebecca, thank you for inviting me and Harvey. It's great to be here with everybody today. Um, as Harvey said, I work for AECOM, which is a large international global consulting company that works on infrastructure planning design. Um, and my particular interest in what you guys are talking about here today is the work that I did along with many other folks from Warpsey and the City of Columbus, Delco Water, USGS, um, the Ohio Water Development Authority, and many other stakeholders in the region. And I think that that's one of the keys to talking about climate change and planning for the future is it's got to be a process of collaboration across the entire region. The city can't do it by themselves and Morpsey can't do it by themselves. It takes a lot of uh, partnership and input all together. So the process that we went through as a team um, in our adaptive management planning approach was first to go through a vulnerability assessment in the entire watershed um, and look at what the risks are. And John talked a little bit about that during his presentation with increased nutrients and in uh, lower flows at different periods of time during the year than what we maybe have experienced before, and then higher flows maybe in October or the fall. And as you look out to the future, those extreme events just become more extreme. So how does a community and a region plan for those things is critical. Um, after we did the vulnerability assessment, we looked at prioritizing the risks and, and looking at that over time. Um, and from, from that risk prioritization, we determined what adaptation strategies might look like and then put a plan together. And then the critical piece is where we are right now, um, which is continuing to meet and look at things and look at how things change. This has been about a five-year process so far. Um, and all the stakeholders continue to be involved and continue to look at what we need to do in the future because things change. Um, so we looked at kind of three periods of time. Right now, 2015 to 2025, and then a midterm range, which was 2025 to 2045, and then out to 2090. And I think a lot of our climate mapping would look a lot like what John showed you. But um, I just thought this was an interesting thing to look at for this group. This is a land cover map um, from 2010 that you, you would see in the Morpsey uh, Insight 2050 study. And then if you, the red area is developed land. So you can see 2035 and then looking out to 2090, what the region's going to look like and what the implications of more and more impervious area and developed land has, what the impact has on um, our water resources and how climate change plays into that is really critical to consider. Um, so going back to the adaptive planning and strategies, when we developed the plan, we really tried to focus on how we can have strategies in the plan that are no regret strategies. What, how do we identify those critical pieces so that we have water resources for the region that we can rely on and um, that will be there for all of us to have healthy, productive lives. Um, and we looked at strategies that are focused on planning. We also looked at operational strategies, how different water utilities can work together. Um, if something is going on in the city of Columbus, how do they work with Delco Water? to make sure they've got backup supply or, or vice versa. And then also the critical piece is what capital improvements need to be made, how much do those cost, and how long do you need to 
to plan to make those because some of the capital improvements that need to be made in response to climate change are very costly to a region and to all of us. Um, so this is just a really brief list of some of the things in the short term, the mid term, and the long term that were developed through the adaptive management planning. In the short term, we looked at operational procedures, like I mentioned before, how can utilities in the region work together, and how can the individual utilities manage their operations in different ways. Um, improving emergency preparedness, which, you know, we're all aware of different things that have happened across the United States with hurricanes and different weather events. How does central Ohio better prepare for what can happen here? Um, talking about demand reduction and pollutant education, nutrient runoff, things like that. How can the region be more focused on those? And then in the long term, <coughs> mid-range term and long term, it's really looking at larger investments that the community and that the region might need to make with building more reservoirs and looking at how to have water supply in a varying climate. So I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, we'll go through all of them and then we'll have a discussion. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm just gonna say that. Stay. It's okay. okay. Hi, I am Maria Conroy. I uh, am a, an associate professor in city and regional planning. Been here since about 2000. As Harvey said, much of my uh, work has focused on sustainable development in general, um, but more recently has moved to water as a critical concern. Water quantity and water quality, as you've heard from the pre prior two remarks, are really inherently tied to land use. And planning as a profession really is look, looking to um, the decisions made about land use to create healthy and vibrant communities. So more and more planning is focusing on the intersection rather than on kind of siloed areas where we traditionally worked in transportation and housing and environment, but we're looking more and more now at the intersection of those areas. So. I wanted to focus, um, and I know my students that are here, um, that are around Sprinkled, are going to be surprised that I actually don't have a PowerPoint presentation going on for this, but um, we're going to shake things up a little. Um, I have two <coughs> research projects that are currently in progress um, that deal specifically with water or watershed issues. One is looking at watershed-based planning in Ohio, and it's in collaboration with um, researchers in looking at respective issues in Kansas and South Carolina and how um, we deal with watershed planning, originally looking at uh, the Clean Water Act's 319 grants that look at total maximum daily loads of, of pollutants basically coming into uh, waterways. But as we got into it, um, we found that Ohio actually has about eight different watershed planning opportunities that overlap in some cases and completely ignore each other in others. So it started to get into detangling that effort and understanding um, how decisions about land use actually fit into it. And the surprise or not so surprise ending is that it often doesn't. There's very little review or regard for a community's uh, land use plan or vision uh, when the decisions are made regarding stormwater management and, and um, total maximum daily loads. That project led into an, uh, an ongoing project as well, which is looking at adaptive green stormwater uh, infrastructure management uh, and climate change as it pertains to the Midwest. Um, we're looking at the institutional and programmatic frameworks in the kind of some of the most populated cities in uh, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and saying, what activities do you have? Are these activities uh, integrated with your land use plan? Um, are they a separate issue? Um, and again, more and more we find that these decisions, the decisions that are being made uh, are being made more in silos than in an in interconnected kind of sense of, in the planning field, we push the idea of one water 
um, that it's all connected, stormwater, wastewater, drinking water, um, and it's not beneficial to be pulling those uh, elements apart for decision-making purposes and planning purposes. A third project that's ongoing is actually uh, being spearheaded by my one of my PhD students that's looking at source water protection planning um, in Ohio and uh, surrounding states and the issue of how, what levels of protection can we put in place um, and how do those, how do documents that are going towards the EPA relate to community land use plans and private landowner decisions um, that could affect the uh, mostly the quality of uh, source water. Interestingly for me those research efforts then kind of come and collide with uh, my role as a member of the City of Col Columbus Development Commission where I see on basically a monthly basis how theory and practice are about um, really far apart <laughs> uh, and and try not to get too discouraged when looking at, well, we know what to do. How do we go from what to do to doing it? Um, and so that's kind of uh, an area of concern and I'm hoping that some of our discussion here can keep the ball rolling forward. <coughs> Well, there's, a, I think, just a slide of campus rulers, and I, I don't really have a presentation. I actually, um, you know, probably the least qualified um, to be up here. Um, I'm just a recovering landscape architect, and um, I think there's a 12-step program for that. <laughs> the, um, and I spent a lot of my career um, working on projects in downtown Columbus, um, and I'd like to say that I come to this with a great deal of knowledge and experience. I don't. Um, I never had a great epiphany about water. Um, but I did, through my experiences downtown, become very interested in the rivers um, in Columbus. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we started with uh, a project called North Bank Park where we first started um, looking into uh, the river through the urban core trying to understand why it was what it was and you know found that what people thought were levees were really nothing more than piles of fly ash that had been piled up when they built the freeways and they weren't really levees and in fact if there had been a flood they would have been peninsulas and really started asking questions as to why um, the urban riverfront through downtown was what it was. Um, we took down some of those levees. Uh, we're told that you know, we placed the arena district at great risk. We didn't, we knew we didn't. Um, and we, we just kept asking questions about um, about that. Later on, did the side of mile, and um, after that, had an idea to take a dam out of a river downtown, which um, uh, changed downtown in a lot of ways. Um, subsequent to that, I ended up at the university here, so I'm working my way up the Olentangy watershed. Um, <laughs> probably end my career in Worthington somewhere. <laughs> I'll leave the Scioto to somebody else. But, you know, really, as, as um, a planner, um, and, and the rivers, um, and, and the creeks, and the Allen Creek, Big Walnut Creek, uh, the two rivers, the thing that I find most fascinating and um, is to think about how it relates to climate change, maybe from Columbus's perspective, you know, the most hopeful is how much of these watersheds um, are within land that is completely publicly owned, where the public owns both banks of these. Now I understand there's some debate about that, you know, up on the um, West Bank of the Scioto, but I don't think it's really a question. And that is a tremendous resource and asset for the city, um, for the region actually. And um, I like to think that um, as you think about climate change, what the implications are, at least here regionally, um, that if we have a reason, if we have um, the ability to think ahead and take advantage of that asset, the land that's there and the water and the rivers and the creeks that are going through it, you know, there there is a chance that we can be ready for climate change in a way. Uh, are we ready for it now? No, we can't even get the thought police in Washington to admit that it's happening. You know, so I mean, we got a long way to go. But at least regionally, I think um, there's there's great hope. You know that that um, 
that we can be ready and we can take advantage of the assets that we have and um, continue to turn them into something that's even better. Thanks, Keith. So my name is Jay Martin. I'm a faculty member here at Ohio State. I'm a professor of ecological engineering. Um, some of you might not be familiar with ecological engineering, so I was going to start off by just defining that a little bit as the design of ecosystems for the mutual benefit, <coughs> mutual benefit of humans and nature. And the reason I'm doing this is because I think it has a lot to do with the topics of stormwater, cities, and climate change. Um, and then going on from that, in addition to that um, definition is that these solutions are grounded in natural processes that rely on renewable energies and minimize human engineering. So while we're trying to solve stormwater problems, we can do it in ways that are more sustainable, depend on natural resources as opposed to pumps and chemicals and things like that. And these two pictures you see are of rain gardens that we built. These are actually in Westerville. Um, and they um, intercept stormwater coming off the streets. They increase our capacity to manage stormwater in addition to traditional stormwater treatment systems. So it's a great example of using a natural ecosystem to manage stormwater. And this is another picture of a rain garden. And a lot of the work I've done is increasing the capacity of managing stormwater that would be very helpful with climate change. So while we have existing infrastructure, we can improve that we can retrofit green infrastructure into our existing neighborhoods and further uh, reduce stormwater flows, reduce flooding, and improve water quality. Um, so what I'd like to do next is just talk about some of the current projects that our research group is leading here at Ohio State. And one of the great partnerships we have is with the city of Columbus. Have some of you heard of Blueprint Columbus? Well, just a couple people are. Oh, two. Yeah. Everybody all at once. Blueprint Columbus, sorry. Some people have. So this is a big, uh, ambitious effort by the city of Columbus. Eventually, it's going to expand across the city of Columbus in um, a decade or a dozen years. Um, right now, it's focused in about the middle portion of Clintonville. In this area, they're going to have about 400 bioinfiltration cells or rain guards to intercept stormwater flow. Um, so our research team is working with the city of Columbus. You can see these are a couple of the uh, infiltration basins that have been installed already. Um, a couple of the goals from this project, you can, you can see the first two focus on water, focus on reducing sewer overflows, improving water quality. We know that these systems can do that, but it's important to quantify it for the city of Columbus. Some of the new research that we're doing here is looking at what kind of habitat do these systems provide? Do they improve property values? Can they actually stabilize neighborhoods? Do they have an impact on the communities? Um, so as we move forward and try to economically value these this green infrastructure. We know the first two work, but if we can find out that it's actually adding habitat, improving property values, we can increase the value of these things and get better comparisons of them with traditional uh, gray infrastructure, if you will. That's in the novel research we're doing there. Um, John talked about, and others have talked about, the watersheds that are north of um, Columbus. Lake Erie also has water quality issues, harmful algal blooms I'm sure some of you have heard of, and this involves watersheds flowing into Lake Erie. And it's the management of these Lake Erie watersheds that our group is working on. So what we look is what types of management actions can farmers and other stakeholders take to reduce nutrient runoff that's going to flow into Lake Erie. There are targets. Um, to meet for nutrient reduction in Lake Erie. So what we do is we run watershed models and we look at different rates of adoption of these various financial plants to determine what types of adoption rates would it take to reach the phosphorus runoff reductions we need to improve the quality of Lake Erie. Related directly to climate change, we are running scenarios of climate change, uh, similar to what John showed earlier. Uh, we do predict an increase in rainfall in this area um, in the coming decades, a half century. So what does that mean for management actions? That means we're going to need increased management actions to counterbalance the increased rainfall and increased phosphorus runoff that's going to happen with climate change. So being aware of that change in the future is really important. Um, and the last project I want to, I want to talk about, um, it's also related to water. This is something we're just starting. We have a, an interdisciplinary research group at Ohio State, project funded by National Science Foundation and their innovations for the nexus of food, energy, and water systems. 
And this is a little bit larger question, but still focuses in on water. So the, the big question is, we've heard a lot of talk from, um, I think Keith called them the thought leaders in Washington, and yeah. things like that, or deglobalization. So if deglobalization happens, or trade wars, what would that mean for food, energy, and water systems around the Great Lakes? And to put that in a real concrete form is, if the price of soybeans or corn doubled because of the trade barrier, what would farmers in Northwest Ohio do? Would they continue to form farm corn and soybeans? What impact would that have on nutrients running off that landscape? So this is some of the types of questions we're trying to answer there. And that's definitely related to climate change because as we see these management practices taking place, they're going to interact with climate change to lead to more or less nutrients coming off the landscape. So this is the end of my concluding my introductory comments. I'll thank Harvey and Rebecca one more time. I want to give a special shout out. I had to leave class early today, and some of the students actually followed me here. So thanks for coming with me. Did you be all them? Not all of them, but some. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your introductory comments, panelists. Um, I guess I'll start off with a couple questions. And I've heard kind of reasons for worry and hope here in Central Ohio. Um, other places in North America and the world, there's more worry, there's more need, there's more cause for worry than hope. Like for example, the sea level rises in places like Florida, Southwest losing water. Um, are we relatively, I don't want to say in good shape, but are we able to weather this water storm better? And if so, how do we prepare for climate migrants here in Central Ohio? Uh, I'll take the first part. <laughs> Somebody else second can part tackle the second one. So yes, uh, some of those maps that I was putting up earlier, uh, we're very fortunate because Central Ohio, even it'll see changes, the changes in this part of the basin are not as severe by any means as most of the basin. So uh, like I said, we'll probably be on the good side of that. The trick is that uh, in Nashville, some years back, about, I don't know, five to seven years back, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, they also are not really expected to have dramatic increases, but they had a torrential downpour that just fell on a very uh, urbanized part of the city. It was very uh, a lot of impervious surface, so everything ran off. And so they had a 500-year uh, flood right inside the city of Nashville. And uh, so that's the trick with climate change. You know, we're kind of showing you the big trends, and what really happens is we get extremes that happen more frequently. So uh, our odds are better in a lot of ways in this part of the world, but that doesn't mean we're necessarily off the hook. So. And I guess the question about uh, climate or migration to central Ohio or to Ohio because of climate change, I think that the Morpsey Insight 2050 planning effort looks at, it, it may not be just targeted on migrants based on that, but um, it certainly looks at how does a region plan for a large population growth. So I think that that's, I think that our region is ahead of the curve when it comes to planning because of the leadership of Morpsey and other participants in those efforts. Um, and again, the sustaining side of it and work that the Nature Conservancy is doing, I think that we're well prepared, becoming more well prepared for adapting to what the climate's going to do in the future. I agree that um, we know that we're going to have a population increase in central Ohio and that whether it is migrants or, or not, um, they're coming. Um, and there have been many efforts to say, okay, where are we going to put them? Um, some of the, while I think we are in relatively good shape, I think John brought up a really good point. Um, the rain of the past couple of days, how many people had to be driving through areas of uh, large puddles and uh, problems on the roadways because of water, because of water pooling, um, not really areas of, of infiltration available. And I think um, the planning is happening, but the implementation is not. We, we are living uh, in a bit of a fearful state, I think, in the, uh, in the planning world where we're afraid to require um, changes on the part of developers uh, to say, instead of, um, yeah, go ahead and put in your large parking lot, um, 
but instead say, you know, that is old business. The new business of usual is you must put in biospoils in that parking lot or have an impermeability. You have to retain X amount on site because it is going to come fast and furious and that's what we need to be planning for and not so much that overall there's going to be, you know, we're, we're still going to be okay um, on the water side, but we need to understand how these events have to be captured and right now um, it's a disconnect. We have the, the, the decisions that happen are basically, well, we'll follow the stormwater regulation guidelines when we get there. Um, and we'll put in a detention, retention pond and everything will be happy. Um, and it won't be. Um, so, and in planning, we have the same, we have the right hand and the left hand problems because on the one hand, we want all these uh, developments to be walkable. And so we want all the units pushed up to the sidewalk. And when we do that, we lose our green space. And so we're making it more walkable and easier to flood. I don't really, I think, you know, managing um, the water issues in Columbus will be relatively, you know, it, it won't be that difficult to do in the years ahead as climate change. There will be more extreme events. Right now, Cannon Drive in the university is being built um, for a 500-year flood, which, you know, in years past, you know, 100 year would have been enough. But actually, it was the insurance company. Um, who insisted that um, Cannon Drive be built for a 500 year standard um, because in Iowa they had two 500 year floods that took out a good bit of the university. So I think, but it, so it's manageable in a certain sense. I think what's really um, more interesting to think about is what happens um, as climate change affects the um, North America, the country you think about. Um, you know, here we are in the Great Lakes with all these water resources, and we're talking about more water, um, while in Phoenix, they're talking about a whole lot less. And, um, and what happens, you know, I mean, the, there was a push years ago to, to um, pump Great Lakes water down to Phoenix, you know, and that was stopped by a coalition of uh, governors from the Great Lakes states. But that stuff's not going to stop. Okay, there's going to be these economic wars that begin um, between the haves and the have-nots with respect to water resources. And, um, you know, Phoenix is down there expanding at an unbelievable rate. Um, and you have to wonder how or why or what the future of that is. Um, of course, you could also wonder why anyone would want to go down to Phoenix, but that's a whole different situation. <laughs> no, thanks. Um, a couple points. One is that, as Keith mentioned, we're pretty fortunate in Central Ohio that we have a good amount of water. Um, so I think as we go forward, we do have to be aware of that. Some precipitation increases are predicted, but we have to especially focus on water quality is what we're going to, is what we're challenged with mostly the, in Ohio right now. Um, and for those migrants, especially for companies and businesses that we want to attract to Ohio, one reason they come here is because we do have a lot of water, but if our water quality continues to be degraded, we're not going to have that advantage anymore. So you really need to keep a focus on the quality of that water. Um, what, was the other, uh, what was the other point I was going to make? All the people moving here. Yeah, no, that wasn't it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the other point. So you talked about kind of the, the rosy scenario and things not so good. So I think the rosy scenario that I see is both uh, around Lake Erie and in Columbus, we are making changes. We are we're aware of climate change. A, a lot of us are, maybe not the thought minders. Um, and you know, with Blueprint Columbus and farmers around Lake Erie, uh, there are changes in behavior and changes in, in design that are taking place. But it's just not happening fast enough, like Maria said. So we really need to just increase, accelerate the adoption of these new practices. Um, I think I'll open up the questions from the audience. And we only have one microphone, so please um, stand up and speak your question loudly. If you have one. Any questions from the audience? Okay, right here. No, first one up. So I know about Blueprint Columbus and we are doing all these changes with Stormwater, but I'm worried probably what Maria said about the new development. I don't see that happening in the new development, and that's completely my puzzling, right? So we are now retrofitting all development 
but when it's developed new, it's not happening so much. So what to do to push the city? <coughs> like, what do you see the pathway forward that you really can <coughs> make this happen? I think that um, some of what needs to happen is this uh, connection between departments as a it's moving this way, but traditionally, planning was over here. Franklin County Stormwater, uh, uh, not Stormwater, Franklin County um, Soil and Water Group is over here. And so it was, we'll approve that development because it's an appropriate land use. We're not going to talk about a, a, you know, whether, how much it contributes to increased stormwater, because that's for these, these other folks to, to handle. Um, some of it is a change in mindset. We have examples of cities that are looking at things more comprehensively. Philadelphia, um, for example, does a lot with looking at development in terms of not just the appropriate of the land, appropriateness of land use, but its contribution to water. Putting in a uh, stormwater utility, for example, is one um, way that even uh, communities in Ohio have done this. They put in a stormwater management utility. Um, every single property owner must pay into it based on their level of impermeability on the, um, uh, for their property. And that money then goes to help fund infrastructure, green stormwater uh, practices, and, and maintenance and other things. So it becomes a, a slow change. I'm not sure, again, because of the um, private property issues in this country and the mentality that that drives, I'm not sure how rapid a change can be made. Um, right now in Columbus, we have a uh, we have a bunch of variances that are specifically worded to deal with if this is going to impede the use of, of you know, somebody's use of the property, then you can get a variance. And so that's where we, we're at. I think, I think it's going to take strong leadership, but I think there's a lot of good examples out there um, to, to move ahead. But it's a, it's a policy change. It's, it's changing the status quo. And so there are, um, so new developments have to follow a new protocol. Any other responses or should we move on to our question? I'll just have a quick response. We know the Ohio EPA just approved some new stormwater guidelines that are um, stronger than the past ones. So some of this is happening. It's just a question of how fast is it happening. Other questions? Yes, please. I had a question. Um, related to the Ohio EPA approval of the Ohio floodplain mapping, which my understanding is that does look at historical 100 years, 500 years. Is there any effort to tie um, development permitting to future forecasting as well as historical if we think that the rate of change of flooding is going to be changing. Everyone in the back get that question? Yep, thumbs up. Okay, thank you. Um, I think in relation to uh, the observation that Jay had a little bit ago, if I remember right, Ohio EPA um, is actually thinking about this a little bit. So they I believe they were using um, some newer uh, climate predictions, basically. And uh, they did that maybe in 2014 or somewhere in that neighborhood. So uh, there's a little bit of thought along those lines, um, but that would be more within the city's uh, floodplains that could be not only in the city, but just outside the city. That would be something a little bit different. And, um, you know, that's something that I don't think we've really gone far enough with. We're still in a lot of places thinking about the 100-year floodplain. And the trick is that basically the uh, predictions of what a flood that's a 100-year flood would look like are based on uh, most of the time our past record. And we are changing definitely to a new period of uh, record in uh, extremes. So I don't think we're really there uh, largely for floodplains specifically. There is a lot of stormwater. Uh, work that is good and is ongoing. So. Other panelists? Okay, no. okay. Um, let's see, there's a question back there. You with the red cap. Okay. 
Hi. Uh, my question for you all is, uh, you all are water experts, and so I'm inclined to trust your views. I see you all up there with uh, one-time use plastic bottles. Um, is an unspoken takeaway of that, that that I shouldn't worry about it, that you all support that and that's the way to go? You wait, can blame me for that one, actually. That, that's our caterer. <laughs> we'll talk to the caterer about this. You're not the first person to comment on that. So. Don't blame them. They're they, had, they had nothing to do with it. It was provided. But we, also, we also are the ones that are taking it, so we can just say we don't want it and go to a water fountain and fill up our own bottles. So it, it starts at everybody at our seat. the stormwater standards at Ohio EPA, there's a deadline for comments on the statewide stormwater between the seminars of April 4th. I would appreciate if 50 or 100 people in this room commented asking for better groundwater infiltration in, in the statewide EPA information for stormwater. Uh, second question I have is, for maybe I, Maria or somebody I mentioned inside 2050, could, uh, whoever uh, brought that up, could you say something about, is there someone, some entity, a uh, jurisdiction in Central Ohio that's actually working on implementing that to the max degree, the, the drastic reduction in the environmental footprint through Insight 2050 is hundreds of square miles? Well, I don't, I don't have the answer to that question, but there is someone here from WARPC who might be willing to say something about it. Um, sure. Hi, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> this is Rachel Beeman from the Ohio Regional Planning Commission, who I worked with on sustaining Sciota. So, do you want to comment? Sorry. Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm a water resources planner at WARPC. And um, Anthony, to answer your question, I would say that yes, many of our central Ohio um, municipalities are implementing Insight 2050. I think that Dublin is a really good example of that. And um, a lot of these smaller comprehensive plans, such as the University District Plan here in the city of Columbus, are also good examples of it. And we're, it's, um, <clears throat> there's a lot, it takes a lot to get uh, some of our representatives to think in this new, frame of mind and it takes some leadership and some turnover and new people coming into leadership positions to really encourage uh, better decision making. I think we're starting to see that. I think it's gonna the ball's gonna start rolling faster. Thank you. Thanks, Do green roofs have a, an effective role to play in water management? Most certainly. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. The question was regarding green roofs um, and their role to play in, in water management. I think a lot of the efforts um, on any of the green stormwater infrastructure work uh, really come down to the fact that there is no silver bullet. Not There's not going to be, well, let's put a green roof on everything and we're problem solved. Um, there are going to be situations where a green roof makes the most sense. Um, situations where perhaps it's a you know a bioswale that goes in or a um, rain garden and a curb cut kind of thing so it's as much on appropriateness but yes um, they do a multifaceted uh, benefits in terms of reducing heat island impacts they provide habitat they they, they do it all is what they, you know it, but it has to be in the right um, situation but Jay probably has more specific um, I'll just say it's been proven that they reduce stormwater volume and, in, and improve stormwater quality and provide a lot of the other benefits that Maria talked about, habitat and heat island and things like that. So they, they work. Um, it's economics. It's the type of building you're putting them on and finding the right spot, like Maria said. I also heard that it can be helpful in, in solving the bee problem, you know, colony collapse. That's well, yeah, that's, uh, I won't uh, comment on that. I'm sorry, but does anybody else want to handle the bees? But I had another observation. So it just goes back to habitat, right? I mean, if you mm -hmm. if you provide the appropriate, it's a hope. I mean, there's we've got I guess on West Campus, right? We've got some apiaries. Yeah. Uh, we have areas. Um, Hall. Hall. Mm -hmm. So 
Oh, I was saying for things specifically. Oh. oh. So uh, the quick point that I was going to make is that uh, the city of Louisville has actually had to think uh, really hard about stormwater over the last, uh, I don't know, five years or so. And they basically were ordered by the courts to do some things to uh, make their sewer overflows not so bad. And so they were diverting a lot of stormwater. And one of the solutions they came up with are really what they call green streets. And so they actually have like many city blocks uh, concentrated in certain areas where the water's captured in a lot of cases off of the roofs. It's captured off the roads. It's run through uh, really almost on a massive scale uh, rain gardens. Uh, they call them bottomless planters. So they're basically like uh, tree planters with no bottoms and intentionally are running the water down into the ground. So there's a whole host of things that you can do. And uh, again, as Jay pointed out a lot of them are things that you can do in areas that have already been developed. It's nicer if you start on the front end, but um, there's certainly some things you can do at a really large scale. If I remember right, Louisville, I think they're up to somewhere around 10 to 15 percent of their stormwater is actually infiltrated just in those green streets, so it's pretty significant. So I have a question. So I thought, let's use the microphone real quick. So I, I found it was really interesting when you said that the goals of walkability and intensification are in conflict with, can, um, be. can be, can be in conflict. Um, so the Anderpong Grill in the room right now in Columbus is a Smart City Columbus project. Is there any kind of interaction between that project and thinking about some of these futures and how we're going to deal with, um, you know, climate change? Or is it just like, let's get the lights on and not worry about that stuff? I mean, is there any discussions at all thinking about the, the, those futures? Do you want to say Well, I have something, but it's, it might happen, but Maria might have more insight. Uh, well, I, I can tell you, it, um, a lot of the Smart City Columbus, a lot of the discussion has been on the very real need of first mile, last mile, and providing um, kind of health and human services opportunities to people in, the, in lower socioeconomic areas. Um, at least that was the intent when it first went out. Uh, however, it, some of the discussion that has happened in the planning community has been, but you're still putting people in cars. Um, you're still dealing with the infrastructure of the automobile and it's still that um, impermeability. And so from that end, there has been, but not really from uh, anything else that I'm, I'm really familiar with. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm not involved in the, the smart city planning, but if, if I was, one thing that I, I think should be a part of it would be this idea called smart sewers. Um, this is something that's gonna, gonna be a part of every municipality probably in a decade, if not sooner, and this has been proven in quite a few places. And what smart cities implies is that you're using your existing infrastructure, but you're putting in sensors to control uh, dams or control the valves in the pipes so that when you see a storm coming, you see the weather forecast, you can control those sewers to optimize the volume you have in those sewers to store water in them for as long as you can and then release that water when you need to. So you can really maximize the volume and the, and the system you have. And this has been done in South Bend and a couple other cities with really um, large reductions in stormwater overflows, like 30, 40 percent. So. I, that's got to be happening in Columbus. I don't know if it's part of the smart city. You anticipate my follow-up question. Yeah. <laughs> technology technology. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. So the, the city of Columbus does have a comprehensive model of their sewer system. And I know I'm not part of what they're doing with it, but I know that they are working with a couple of the different providers of real-time control methodology like MNET, who is the lead in South Bend. Um, so they are looking at that and trying to implement some real-time control within the collection system. And I think that that's really a, an important next step. Now, in Chicago, one of the interesting things that they're doing that is a smart city um, component, I don't know that Columbus is looking at this yet, but um, they have got a pilot project um, out on Goose Island in Chicago where they have embedded sensors into a bioswale to get data about how 
the water is being processed through a bioswale so that they can use that as planning for in a smart city kind of way um, to manage water. Strong work going on. Yes, and back, please. Yes, in terms of our stormwater, we have that ORS project. Speak it up a little bit. Uh, the ORS project downtown, is that fully operational? Is that starting to divert that stormwater? I can answer that. Yes. <laughs> well, right next to you. Uh, they are is mostly operational. They're working on it. There was a decision made about pumps that went in with other tunnels. They have housing around the pumps, and ours is submersible. <coughs> they come up with some issues that are mostly safety issues for people going in, so they're working on making sure everything's safe. But as far as the system goes, it works. So is, are we seeing the benefits then? It's coming along. Coming along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the big sewer tunnel we built under the yes. side of the way. Is that what we're talking about? Because of the consign combined sewer flow issues? That's your yes. 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 Yes, here. Is reducing water consumption an issue in Central Ohio, or do we have so much water that that's really not a critical issue going forward in Ohio, in Central Ohio? I don't work for the Division of Water, so. You know, this is, you know, my opinion and what I hear is we don't necessarily need people to reduce their consumption. I think that that has happened and it continues to happen as people buy washing machines and appliances that use less water. It, it has happened already. Um, so it's not an issue here like it is in the Southwest or other places. There is also a... Um, Kind of a broader discussion that uh, deals with the notion of peak water. We talk about peak oil, um, but there is still a concern of peak water, and it gets to what Jay had talked about, and that is that we tend to think of well, water as a renewable resource, um, but water quality issues are going to be the, the bigger concern. We already have areas where um, that are aquifer based in not so much in Ohio, but that have had such drawdown um, that there have been sub subsidence problems and that has caused contamination of the aquifer and then has impacted, obviously, um, the water supply. We're primarily surface um, water driven and that's where the uh, we have uh, regulations related to source water protection but doing things like plans is a voluntary effort. Um, then those plans to make sure that the regulations are, are going to be followed, that kind of thing. So I think yes, we um, we are in in we aren't in a situation where we're worried about uh, water quantity right now. Um, but because of the relationship to quality, uh, it, it's going to be more of a concern of um, pollutants getting into that supply. I have a like a personal question. So I live, this is for Keith. I live a mile and a half down the river, Old Tangy River in Harrison West, and I'm really glad that Ohio State's protecting their hospitals, but should I sell my house? How close to the river? Maybe. <laughs> 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 no, I, I think it plugged her. Yeah. I don't think you'll be um, you'll have to sell your house. Um, but I do think over time you know, the, the flood protection of um, existing cities, whether it's rising seas or rivers, is going to have to become more aggressive in areas that are already developed. Um, you know, I don't think that what we experienced when we started on Canada Drive, we were shooting for the 100-year you know, flood protection, and we are driven to it by, for economic reasons. You know, we needed insurance on our hospital. We weren't going to get it, you know, unless we raised it. That's, that's a problem when you get a few billion dollars tied up in a hospital. So the stadium, is that in the five year plan? Well, the stadium, interestingly enough, is where the Old Tangier River used to be. Um, yeah. So, you know, which just proves how important football is. Don't let a river get away with a good football game. But, I mean, no, it's sort of ridiculous, really, but, you know, it's such an icon, you're never going to move it. I mean, it's pumped all the time, you know. Um, and when they added seats, you know, they lowered it even further into the groundwater, which is, you know, once again, sort of shows you the power of, you know, athletics. 
but um, and I'm not sure how much sense that made, you know. But it's it is what it is, and um, but I, I really think you know cities uh, all around the country are going to be looking for ways. You know, Nashville. Somebody mentioned you know 500 year flood. Iowa had a couple of them. It's going to happen, um, and then hopefully um, your house is protected. <laughs> One last question because we're just out of time. Yes, sir. I, I think it's great to talk about Blueprint Columbus for those that aren't aware. That's because of the Ohio EPA City of Columbus consent decree. Again, as, as was earlier said, this is remediation because our failing stormwater, combined sewer overflows, dumping out millions of gallons when any major wet weather event, heavy rainfall, hits us and our piping system cannot contain it. Uh, so that's all being done. Fortunately, the, I mean, ORS was great, but a lot of environmental groups say, why are we burying the problem underground? Let's do it from a prevention point of view at the source. And now we brought it above ground, which is great. And they found out, hey, we can do it less, less it's cheaper, and we can hire local labor versus hiring uh, people from European countries with knowledge of these big, giant underground boring machines uh, and that we hide that problem away. So it, it's kind of good that it happened, but the uh, city companies had to go to the Ohio EPA director and to the judge to get a variance to try the blueprint, you know, as a pilot project to see if it works. And just like we don't even know if that pipe works yet, but we'll hopefully keep our fingers crossed that it will. Any last comments from the panelists? I feel hopeful, you know, that you're listening to you, that things are moving forward, people are thinking about this. A little worried about Keith's water wars or anything. <laughs> I don't think Phoenix can take us, but... Um, no, I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, thank you very much for your uh, comments, panelists, and thank you. <laughs> we have two more events, March 30th, April 17th, cura.osu.edu. Hope to see you there. Yeah. Uh,